Good morning and welcome to worship at Our Shepherd Lutheran Church. My name is Sam Jeske. I have the joy and privilege of serving as the pastor here at Our Shepherd Lutheran Church, a Christ-centered, mission-minded congregation located in northwest Indiana, uh, moved and motivated by God's grace to reach out to all within the, the region, shining and showcasing uh, who our Savior is and what he has done for us. Whether you're a first-time guest or visitor or you're a, a member of Our Shepherd, I'm so glad that you could join us for worship this Sunday morning. It wouldn't have been the same without you. Um, as we continue this Epiphany season, focusing on our service series, Seeing the For You in Christ, um, we're going to be focusing primarily on the theme today, um, The God Who Calls You Is Worth Following. May God richly bless us in his word and in song today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends, let us approach God with a true heart and confess our sins, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin. 
for faithless worrying and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do. You should cast me away from your presence forever. O Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in our sins. Hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's go to our God in prayer. Almighty God, you sent your Son to proclaim your kingdom and to teach with authority. Anoint us with the power of your Spirit that we too may bring good news to the afflicted, bind up the brokenhearted, and proclaim liberty to the captives. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first lesson for today actually comes from our gospel, uh, the gospel of Mark chapter 1, where here we see Jesus in his grace, out of his love, calling his first disciples, who happened to be fishermen. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Our second section of scripture, which will also serve as the basis of our, of our sermon devotion today, comes from 1 Kings chapter 19. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come back with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his attendant. If you had just one word to describe former CEO and founder of Apple, Steve Jobs, what would that one word be? Would it be charismatic, or inspirational, or revolutionary, or brilliant. When he co-founded Apple out of his parents' garage, he was already all of these things. He had this instinctual gaze on the market, and it showed in how little market research he actually did. As he saw it, he was like this grand conductor, and the market was just another part of his orchestra. But his real brilliance was his insistence that the customer isn't always right. Steve Jobs knew how to, how to make a product, not just make a product, but he also knew how to market a product that people didn't even know they needed. But as soon as they saw it, they knew they did. Jobs was 
a guy who was deeply committed to not committing himself to any mold or methodology. Always thinking horizontally, always thinking outside of the box. A grand visionary. And when Jobs unboxed the iMac in 1998, he knew that this personal computer would not only lay the foundation of Apple's dramatic financial turnaround, its dramatic financial comeback, and, and the revitalization of a dying company, but that personal computer, the iMac, would solidify Steve Jobs as one of the greatest innovators of the 21st century. Steve Jobs was a man with unrelenting vision, determined to revelize not just the United States, but the entire world. And that's exactly what he did. That's a tough act to follow, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, can you imagine how current CEO Tim Cook must have felt when Steve Jobs handed him the keys in 2011? When Steve Jobs passed him the baton? I, I can't imagine the weight of expectations, many of which had to have been unrealistic or just simply unfair. But would you expect anything less when you take up the mantle of one of the most brilliant minds of our time? In the section of scripture set before us today in 1 Kings 19, we see someone else taking up the mantle too. Quite literally, in fact. The prophet Elijah is passing on the mantle to Elisha, his successor. And while this mantle would most certainly be a heavy one, one that was also demanding and came with seasons of hardship and even persecution, Elisha, by faith, knew that the God who called him was worth following. And that God would empower and equip him to follow. Our section of scripture picks up uh, from 1 Kings 19, drops us around 848 B.C. And at this time, the nation of Israel was bitterly divided into two kingdoms, you the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Not only was this a time of significant warfare between Israel and Judah and the neighboring nations around them, but this was also a time of significant moral and spiritual decay in both Judah and Israel. Israel, for example, they had, they had abandoned the Lord they had rejected his covenant with them. They had broken down his altars and even persecuted the prophets that God had sent to them. They, like the nations around them, worshipped the Baals, these crude, cruel, man-made gods of the Canaanites. The Israelites, they, they built shrines and temples in their name. They engaged in temple prostitution so as to entice Baal, the chief of these gods, to bring fertility to farms and families throughout the land. We even see cases of human sacrifice taking place in Israel at this time. All this is just testament to how bad it had gotten. So go figure, this was an extremely hostile environment, not only for Christians, faithful believers, uh, faithful children of the promise, but also the Lord's prophets who were called to serve there. But that's exactly where God wanted his voice to be heard. That's exactly where God called and equipped Elijah to serve as his prophet. But Elijah's tenure as prophet was, was coming to an end. And it was time for him to find a replacement. But God didn't need Elijah to put a one ad in the Jerusalem Times. God had already chosen Elijah's successor. His name was Elisha. Elijah walks right up to Elisha and throws his cloak around him, signifying the mantle of prophet had been passed on to him. There was work to be done, but in a different field. As of that moment, Elisha was now a farmer of a different kind. 
Elisha would now labor in God's field, proclaiming God's coming Messiah and the hope, the healing, the peace, and the joy, and the deliverance and salvation that that Messiah, that Savior, would bring to us, this world, those spiritually dead and dying in this dark world. But right now, Elisha was first called to follow Elijah. Right now, it was time for him to, to be mentored by Elijah. Class was now in session. <laughs> Talk about massive sandals to fill. Elisha's mentor, Elijah, would go down as one of Israel's most beloved, most remembered prophets. It was Elijah who had the guts to stand before the entire nation of Israel and call them out for their unbelief. It was Elijah who had the courage to tell King Ahab, Israel's king, that the one true God, the Lord, would withhold rain over the entire land, all to show Ahab how wrong he was and how helpless his false god, Baal, was to provide for him. It was Elijah who, who called for a showdown on Mount Carmel between him and the 450 priests of Baal. It was Elijah who called down fire from the Lord on the altar that he had built, which is proof to everyone there that the Lord was the one true God, that he is God. But the calling to be the Lord's prophet, while it certainly had its highs, it, it wasn't all roses. When Elijah confronted King Ahab the first time and called him to repentance, Ahab was ticked, and he channels all his anger towards Elijah, forcing Elijah to flee and hide for safety. And he wasn't the only one who had to do so. Hundreds of other prophets were forced into hiding at this time for fear of their life. Apparently, the persecution was so bad that there were even prophets who were killed because of their message. Yes, Elijah had his, his triumphs and his high moments and the victories that God had granted him, but he had his low moments too. Moments he was convinced that the, that the best thing that God could do for him was to retire him from ministry permanently. And in the face of Elijah's accomplishments or his adversities, It'd be easy for young Elisha to look at himself by comparison and think, God, maybe you've got the wrong guy. I don't know if you've looked at my portfolio long enough. I may, maybe I'm not cut out for this profit business. I can't do it. And chances are, you know the feeling. Those times that you're afraid to share your faith because you're afraid that your peers will call you close-minded, bigoted, or intolerant. Or maybe it's those times when, you're, when you know standing up for your God, for what your God has said and, and done for you in this entire world, standing up for his truth invariably invites persecution into your life. You hear Christ's call, come, follow me. And we bristle at the idea of walking a narrow path of lifelong cross-carrying and daily death to self. But your Savior continues to call. He calls to us and he says, love me. Love me more. Love me more than money. Love me more than your job. Love me more than your friends. And love me more than even your, your family. Love me more than anything. And such a calling intimidates us, doesn't it? It intimidates us because such a message is countercultural. To love God up above everything? Not just countercultural, though, but to love God and His Word and His truth and to share that message is, is offensive to people, isn't it? Christ calls us to live a life of complete, total commitment and dedication to him, but 
We also know, as one theologian put it, to be a Christian will cost a man the favor of the world. And why wouldn't that be true? The Jesus that we are called to follow and, and to proclaim, he is no ordinary guy. He's someone far greater than someone like Steve Jobs. He claims to be someone far greater. He's the Son of God, the creator of the world. He claims that his kingdom is not of this world. So why wouldn't the Christian find himself losing favor with this world then should they desire to pick up their cross and follow him? But maybe your reservation isn't because of the inevitable, inevitable adversity for being a Christian. And maybe you're afraid that God can't do all that much with someone like you. You feel like your voice doesn't carry that much weight. So how could you share the message of Jesus with someone? You ask, why would anyone listen to someone like me? After all, you didn't go to some Bible college. You didn't go to some fancy seminary. How could you possibly be considered qualified to preach such a message? Or, or maybe at such a calling of complete commitment to Christ, you look at your own life and say, God, I, I haven't done that. I struggle to do that. You look at your rap sheet of sins that just dog you all the time. The things that you said or done that keep you up at night. The things that, you, that, 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 that weigh on your heart as a result that, that have made a complete mess of your life. or The dysfunction in your life, or whatever it might be. And you look at all of this and you think, what could God possibly work from this? What good could he bring about from this mess that I've made? How could God possible, how could he possibly love someone as, as broken and dysfunctional and unfaithful, undedicated and uncommitted to him as me? But that's what happens when we look at the wrong person to be the hero of the story. The story of Steve Jobs is no exception. Maybe as Tim Cook took up the mantle of Apple CEO, he thought, how could I possibly compare to, to someone like Steve Jobs? But as brilliant as Jobs was, he struggled with self-absorption. He was voted out of his own company. Uh, granted, he created a competing company and then later sold that company to Apple for $429 million. But that didn't make him a great listener. He wasn't, according to some of his closest colleagues. Sure, Apple brought him back on as CEO, but his employees couldn't stand him. Many today see him as a global icon, but some will remember him as an egocentric bully. Steve Jobs was a broken, dysfunctional sinner, just like the rest of us. So, who's the hero of this story? Who's the hero for our story today? I get where folks might point to Elisha or Elijah, like they're the Steve Jobs of this story, saying that, you know, the takeaway is we need to be more like them. We need to be as committed and as generous as Elisha. We need to be as tenacious and as dedicated as Elijah. But in, in talking like that, we're looking to the wrong person to be the hero of the story. And we miss the point entirely. Uh, put it this way. Do stories like these put the focus on us, those whom God has called, or on God, the one who calls us? Am I led to marvel at the dedication of the follower or Am I led to marvel at the God who is followed? Think about who Elisha was when God called him to be a prophet. Elijah didn't find him locked away in, 
in some academic library, nor poring over scrolls of scripture, but working outside, plowing fields on the family farm with 11, 11 other hired hands, each of them driving a yoke of oxen. Elijah's successor would be a blue-collar man, a farmer, a guy with dirt-covered clothes, hands blistered and smelling like manure. That's the guy that God had called to succeed Elijah as the Lord's prophet. Had God seen something in, in Elisha that Elijah hadn't seen? Was there some inherent quality that drew God to this man? Had God stumbled across Elijah's LinkedIn account? Had God found him on ProfitMatch.com? Was it because Eli Elisha had, had gone to some seminary for eight years or attended a couple workshops on how to be a successful prophet? No. No, it was, it was God's grace that called him. As it was God's grace that was sufficient for him. This story highlights both the beauty and the scandal of God's grace. That he would take the weak things of this world to shame the strong. That he would take the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. But how even more apparent that is in Jesus. Certainly we see, we see God's grace as Jesus calls ragtag fishermen and tax collectors to be fishers of men, to be his disciples, to come and follow him. But we see the beauty and scandal of God's grace in Jesus in an even greater way than that. Jesus, God, he would become man. He would walk among the creation that he had come to save. And he would come to live die and rise to save us. We, undedicated, unfaithful, uncommitted sinners. Jesus, he in love, was perfectly dedicated for us. Jesus, in love, was perfectly faithful for us. He, in love, was perfectly committed to saving us perfectly committed to his Father's will and his saving mission to redeem us from sin. On the cross, Jesus took all our sins of faithlessness, our sins of lukewarm Christianity, our sins of self-absorption and lack of dedication. He took all those sins onto himself. And in exchange, he gave us his perfect dedication, his perfect commitment, and his perfect faithfulness. At the waters of our baptism, our Savior throws over our shoulders the mantle of his righteousness. When the good news of Jesus was shared with you, God the Holy Spirit worked saving faith in your heart. Not because of something that you said or did or because you possessed some inherent quality that drew God to you, but entirely because of his grace entirely because of his love, his undeserved love for you. Your God, by his word, he reached out to you and worked faith in your heart, a faith that clings to Christ and looks to him alone for forgiveness and confidence before God. And he who, by his power, brought you to faith will empower you and equip you to carry out the vocations that he has given you. Our God doesn't set us up for failure. Now, when it comes to the vocations that he has given you, he equips those he calls. Elisha was eager to pick up the mantle as the Lord's prophet, and that's commendable. But what's ultimately worth noting isn't Elisha's dedication, but the God worthy of his dedication your God is worth following to the ends of the earth. After all, he is the God who would lovingly pursue you in love to the ends of the earth. That God is worth following wherever he may lead us, always. 
Amen. fire and have the gift to all inspire and have not love my words are vain as sounding brass and no bliss gain Let's go to our God in prayer. Almighty God, we come before you with humble thanks and gratitude that you would send your one and only Son to not only personify your amazing love and dedication to us, but that he in love for us was completely committed to your will and would die to save us from our sins. May that amazing love move and motivate us always in every vocation you have graciously given and equipped us to carry out. Help us, each, each of us, to faithfully do the work which you have called us to do. We pray today that you look with favor upon our nation. Restore peace where there is discord. Bring harmony where there is division. Reconcile each and every one of us to one another by your gospel. We pray especially today that you also bless President Biden and Vice President Harris and all the leaders that you and your wisdom have established to rule and govern our nation. By your grace, enable them to lead our country with wisdom, honesty, courage, integrity, compassion, and justice. May we, by your guidance, continue to enjoy our cherished liberties, peace, and freedom but most importantly, continue to allow your church to freely share the joy we have in your son Jesus as we proclaim the good news of sins forgiven and the peace that we have with you eternally through him. All this we pray in his saving holy name and pray also the prayer that you have taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Good morning again. Thank you so much for joining us for worship at Our Shepherd Lutheran Church. If you haven't done so already, be sure to fill out our eConnect card. You can find the link for that um, either on our website or in the description of this video um, or on our worship webcast if you're watching it through our website. Um, also, um, if you found this worship service uplifting and edifying, share this with someone today. My encouragement for you today is... Uh, um, is to, is to share this good news with people. We have a God who has died for us, lived a perfect life for us, and opened um, the mansions of heaven for us to be with him forever. Um, we have an amazing God who loved us that much that he would win for us a joy, hope, and peace that is unassailable, uh, that is intimately wrapped up in who he is, and he graciously, because of who he is, has given that to you. So give this joy to people today. That would be my encouragement for you. This is a great way to, to witness, to, to, to engage in some outreach and to share the joy that we have in Jesus, not just as a, as a ministry, but us personally as Christians. Um, also, if you found this, this, this uh, if you find the ministry of Our Shepherd to be uplifting and encouraging, or if you would like to support the ministry of Our Shepherd, um, we know that our God, he, he, deigns to use means, and one of the means that he uses to advance his kingdom are, are, are the treasures that we do give. Um, your contributions, uh, be it small or large, God uses them to advance his kingdom here in Northwest Indiana, and that gives us, um, allows us to do more as a ministry, uh, to reach out to more and to share um, the joy that we have in Jesus and get more of the gospel to more people more often. Um, you can do that by mailing in contributions to our physical location at 1515 West 93rd Avenue in Crown Point, Indiana. Or what you could do is you can go to our website at rshepherdcp.com and there you can give um, either a one-time contribution or reoccurring contributions on our secure online portal. A couple quick announcements. Uh, we got our Midweek Ruth Bible Study. If you haven't joined us for that, I'd highly encourage you to do so. This is great inreach in our congregation. It's a great opportunity for us to all get connected together, but it's time for us to be fed in God's Word. Um, all the busyness and craziness of our lives, this Midweek Ruth Bible Study has been a tremendous blessing for me, and I'm not to speak for the people that who've, who've been coming, but they seem to appreciate it too. We, we dig deep, and we have a great time doing it. Um, if you would like to join us for that, it's not too late. We're not even halfway through the book yet. Um, if you would like to join, uh, you can either send um, an email to, to our shepherd, either through our website um, or through the eConnect card when you fill that out. Um, uh, just let us know that you want the Zoom information. We have that um, every Tuesday night from 7 to 8 p.m. on Zoom. And we'd love for you to come. It would not be the same without you. Um, as for announcements, that's all I got. May God richly bless your week, and we'll see you again next week for worship.